My name is Nate Lighthizer, and uh, I want to thank OptiView for, for having me here. And we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and move more towards the, the inner half of the retina and, and OCTA and diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. It's something that hits home for me. Where I practice, 50 to 60% of our patients are diabetic uh, in our clinical practice. So we have, uh, see a very high prevalence uh, of this and have used this uh, a lot over the last 13 months that we've had it. So, you know, why is this uh, important? We all see diabetic patients, you know, and, and we all see these probably on a daily basis, if not, you know, multiple patients a day. It's a leading cause of visual impairment. We all know that. Um, it can and take the vision and often unlike macular degeneration where they may lose their vision in their 70s, 80s, or, or 90s, they may lose their vision in their 50s, 40s, or 30s uh, in some of our patients as well. Uh, you know, approximately 25, 26 million Americans have diabetes over the age of 20. That's one out of nine patients. So again, statistically, we're gonna see these patients every single day. One third are not aware that they have the disease. Well, we now have technology where that can detect subclinical diabetic retinopathy. So you're doing your exam and they don't think they have diabetes. Well, maybe you do the scan, maybe you don't, but if you do the scan and we can now pick up some findings uh, of early, uh, maybe clinical diabetic retinopathy and maybe that makes the diagnosis uh, in some patients and we'll talk about that. An additional 80 million uh, are at risk for diabetes because of impaired fasting glucose levels. You know, the, the point I wanted to make here is retinopathy is very prevalent. Almost 30% of patients have retinopathy, and there's multiple risk factors, as you guys know, blood sugar control, uh, what's their hemoglobin A1C, certainly are risk factors. But the longer that they have diabetes, the more likely they're going to develop retinopathy, and they have it for the duration. There is no cure for diabetes. So we're going to see these patients, and we're going to see diabetic retinopathy, and it's probably going to progress uh, over the years. Now, if we can intervene sooner, then maybe we can at least arrest that progression or slow that progression and have a better long-term outcome for the patient. So even though it's, it may progress, if we can educate them sooner, maybe that progression is not going to be as quick uh, in that one there. So the rate of retinopathy uh, at five years for your diabetic patients, you know, if they're, insulin, if they're on insulin, about four out of 10. If they're not, one out of four patients are going to have diabetic retinopathy. At 19 years, like we said before, it's going to progress and nearly all patients on insulin at 19 years are gonna have diabetic retinopathy. It's about a coin flip if they're not on insulin at 19 years. So again, so we know the rates uh, are going to go up. You know, I think this is important. You see that patient today and you do your exam, you do an OCT, you do a fundus photo and they have no diabetic retinopathy and you say, I'll see you in a year. Five to 10% of the patients, one out of 10, one out of 20, are going to have diabetic retinopathy a year from now. I think this is going to change when we have OCT angiography. Yeah, I thought they didn't have diabetic retinopathy today, but they probably did, as you mentioned earlier there. So I think it's important to remember those stats. Even the patients where you don't think they have retinopathy, a decent chunk of them are going to have it a year later. Mild NPDR of those type ones, a good chunk are gonna have PDR in four years, it shows that's progression. And then severe NPDR, half of those are gonna have PDR uh, within one year. Now maybe we can use the OCT angiography to better detect that retinal neovascularization. Maybe it's NVD, maybe it's NVE, whatever it is. Uh, a good chunk of those are gonna progress and have proliferation, neovascularization. And now we have a tool that can better detect that and improve diagnosis. But I think it goes back to this. This is going to be my main message uh, over the course of the next 10 to 20 minutes is earlier detection. If we can diagnose pathology sooner, I believe patients have better long-term outcomes. I always tell the story when I lecture, you know, being from, from North Dakota, I have an extensive family history of multiple sclerosis. I have seven family members on my mom's side that have MS, uh, a lot of them. My aunt was diagnosed about a decade ago and her neurologist, diagnosed by her optometrist in Minnesota, her neurologist told her, you're probably gonna do better because we diagnosed you what we think earlier in the course of disease. I believe the same thing is true for glaucoma and it's true for diabetic retinopathy. If we can detect changes earlier and educate the patient on blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol control, you know, all those vascular risk factors, it's still up to the patient to listen and follow our recommendations, but at least you're making those recommendations earlier and potentially have a better long-term outcome for the patient. This is another slide that I added in, and I think I'm guilty of this uh, going through school, through residency, and really until we started looking at OCT angiography, is diabetes in the macula. We're all very familiar with the edema, correct? We all think uh, of the OCT and diabetic macula, macular edema, but it's important to remember that the macula can go both ways. It can swell, and we see that very nicely with our fundus exam. It can be difficult to detect that, but we have OCT uh, technology that shows that beautifully. But don't forget that the retina can go the other way. How many of you have had that diabetic patient that was 20-25 and you couldn't figure out why? 
or they were 2030 and you couldn't figure out why you looked at the macula and it looked fine. You did a regular OCT and maybe it looked fine, maybe there's a little thinning. Now we have an avenue to look at the vasculature, the microvascular. The diabetic macular ischemia or the DMI, I think we, we forget about sometimes. We're so focused on the edema and it's not thickened, sometimes it goes the other way and the macula is ischemic. And there's some important things to remember about this. We know, and there's your, on fluorescent angiography, what's the standard of care to detect diabetic macular ischemia? It's right there. It's the fluorescent angiography. And what are the downsides of fluorescent angiography or FA? It takes some time, requires an injection. Uh, you know, some patients have a, a fear factor when it comes to that. But that is a fact that it's, it's the standard of care. FA is the sca standard of care to detect diabetic macular edema, at least in the past, and now things are changing. What, why is this important? We know that if their macula is ischemic, it's going to predict retinopathy progression. So now you change their follow-up. They may have no retinopathy, but yet they have diabetic macular ischemia, and instead of seeing that patient in a year, maybe you see them in six months. You educate them better. So we know it predicts diabetic retinopathy predict progression. 41% of patients that have diabetic retinopathy are going to have ischemia, a good chunk of them, and we may not have been detecting it before. Unless you were doing an FA or ordering an FA, now we have a potential uh, or technology that can do that. And you know, an important point here, it can be tied to VA loss. They, may don't, they don't have to be swollen to have VA loss. No, it's usually to the moderate to severe macular ischemia. When they have that degree of ischemia, it can reduce their vision but now maybe we can detect it when it's mild, when it hasn't reduced their vision. I think this is a big take home point is to detect that ischemia, that damage to the macula early when they haven't had uh, vision loss. Maybe they have normal vision at this point in time. So let's get into OCTA and diabetes. What are the advantages? Let's go through these one by one. Again, I think it identifies the earlier stages. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in just a few slides. Craig mentioned it as well. It's that enlargement of the foveolar vascular zone. Capillary dropout or non-perfusion. I can't see that. We all can't see capillary dropout when we're doing our exam on a regular OCT. We can't see an enlargement of the foveolar vascular zone. It's very difficult. Maybe there's a loss of the foveal depression or the foveal reflex uh, on your exam, but we can't see that foveolar vascular zone enlarging. Now we have the ability to do that, and we'll talk more about that. Less invasive. Quick acquisition time. You know, we can acquire these scans in a matter of seconds, three or four seconds to get these images versus a, what, 10 minute, 12 minute fluorescein angiogram takes a lot longer. This is, I think, a big one to emphasize to doctors, to emphasize, you know, spread the messages. When you do a fluorescein, it looks at the first layer of the retina that you can see. It's a 2D planar image, and you're seeing that very superficial vasculature. You're not seeing layer by layer into the different plexi going through the retina. OCTA can. We've got different plexi that we've looked at before, so we can look at the, the superficial layer, the deep vascular layer. It can get down into the choriocapillaris. It has advantages that FA can't look at all of those layer by layer, which is very nice. Uh, it can localize MAs to their exact depth. Again, FA will show there's an MA there, and we'll talk in a little bit. FA is actually a little bit better in detecting MAs versus OCTA. There are studies out there that show that you will detect more MAs with fluorescein angiography versus OCTA, but those that you do detect with the OCTA, it can, it can again localize. Is it in the superficial layer? Is it in the deeper layer? Where is that MA located at uh, right there? And again, it's not dependent on contrast. So some of those MAs that, that don't have fluorescein leakage, you may not be able to detect those with a fluorescein angiogram, but could uh, with an OCT angiography. So we have multiple uh, advantages when it comes to that. When it comes to diabetes, again, the macular ischemia, enlargement of that foveolar vascular zone, very important. We'll show pictures uh, in just a second. And it gives you qualitative data. And in the future, as this technology continues to evolve, quantitative data. You guys like numbers? We all like numbers, don't we? Give us a number, whether it's retinal nerve fiber layer, whether it's ganglion cell, we all like numbers, we all like colors, normative data. Uh, and again, as the technology is advances and software updates get better and better, it, it's gonna be great to look at this quantitative data uh, that we have in the future there. That's very, very nice. And differentiating Irma from, Irma from early Neo, we've all looked at the disc before and saw that, that anomalous vessel. Is it elevated, is it not? Maybe you can tell, maybe you, you can't, and now we have OCT and geography to be able to tell you what layer is that potential neovascularization. Is it maybe a, a shunt vessel on the disc? Is it Irma uh, in the retina, or is this in fact neovascularization? So again, Julie went through the, the normal scans. This is about as normal as you can get. A 26-year-old healthy, 
female optometry student. You know, just a healthy, uh, you can see the superficial capillary plexus, nice foveal vascular zone. So there's the first layer, and there's the second layer. Again, we're switching gears. She was down in the deep retina. We're more in the superficial retina, the inner retina right here, and that's very, very normal. Notice the plushness. I mean, you look at that and you just see a beautiful capillary network. Remember that as we go through some cases here in just a little bit. So here, there's normal. I think it's important to educate our doctors what normal is. And I, I blew this up so you can really see the detail. And there was a patient of ours, a diabetic patient. And very clearly, you can see an enlargement of the foveal avascular zone. We've got some capillary dropout. There's some areas of non-perfusion there. But I think we can all see an enlargement of the foveal avascular zone. And we can see some dark areas surrounding the fovea as well for some non-perfusion. We've got some changes. And as Craig said, we've got diabetic retinopathy here. Regardless of what you're seeing, if you're seeing nothing on the retina, we've got diabetic retinopathy here. Here's the deep capillary plexus. Normally, the foveal avascular zone is a little bit bigger the deeper you get. The deep capillary plexus normally has a little bit larger foveal avascular zone. So don't be tripped up by that. Uh, and there was our diabetic patient again there. You can clearly see the remodeling uh, of those capillaries and enlargement of the foveal avascular zone, capillary dropout. Look at inferior in that scan. Nice patch there. I don't think we can detect that with our own eyes, could we? We're on a regular OCT. That's what makes this technology so exciting as we go forward there. So a couple of cases, uh, diabetic patient, Thanks for Julie for passing this case along. 45 year old African American female. Vision was 20 20 uh, in this case. She's 20 20, got you know, fairly good blood sugar control. That's all relative, isn't it? Blood sugar control. Had a patient with an A1C of 17.3 uh, a few months ago. So it's all relative. 7.0 is a good blood sugar control in this case, but really had no, no issues. 20 20 vision. You take a look at the fundus, fundus photo from you know, kind of a 30,000 feet away perspective. There's a couple of MAs there. And you do the, uh, the OCT, and it was you know, a pretty normal structural B-scan on the OCT. And you look at the ONFOS, and we're seeing some changes there. But then let's go into the OCT angiography. And, and what do you see? Again, we're looking at the superficial capillary plexus on the left, the deep capillary plexus on the right. To me, when I look at this, which of the two scans is more striking to me? It's the one on the right, the deep capillary plexus. And you can clearly see that. That lushness, you know, all of those vessels clearly are not there like they should be. And this patient with a few MAs, you know, I'm gonna follow that patient more closely. You're gonna follow that patient more closely because of this diabetic uh, macular ischemia that's going on in this patient. So another patient, diabetic, some exudates, no CSME. And you can see the exudates there on the regular B scans. And there's your OCT angiography. Again, you're, show, you're seeing these mic microaneurysms. You're seeing the foveal uh, a vascular zone enlarging, and you can clearly see the capillary dropout. You know, things that we're looking at uh, in these diabetic patients. The two scans on the right. We expect much in our diabetic patients in those two scans on the right, and the answer is no. That's, that's the CNVMs, that's the, the AMD, central serous, like Julie talked about, in diabetes for the most part. Can, I can't say it for everybody, but for the most part, those two scans on the right at the outer retina of the chorio capillaris uh, should be normal in most diabetics. So there's your indications. Diabetes, diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Let me show you a couple other cases. Um, this is uh, some images showing a pretty severe diabetic macular ischemia, enlargement of that foveal avascular zone. You think this patient's vision is probably reduced? Probably reduced uh, pretty significantly based on uh, those images right there. A couple of other cases showing some anomalous vessels. You can see capillary dropout. Look at case number one, that bottom right of the image. You, know, you can clearly see the ischemia, the non-perfusion uh, in various areas uh, of this images. So what are the disadvantages? What could you hear from doctors questioning the technology or asking questions uh, about the technology? Well, it requires maybe longer fixation. Now, I think it depends on how you look at this, but it takes three or four seconds of good fixation so you can get both B scans like we talked about versus an FA is a click of the button for one photo but they do have to sit for multiple photos over minutes and minutes and minutes. So ultimately the test is much shorter than a fluorescein angiogram, but the, the fixation for one snapshot is a couple of seconds longer, but I don't think that's an issue at all. But somebody could say, well, it takes three or four seconds of fixation. It does have a smaller field of view. This is the thing you read about the most. A fluorescein angiogram basically gives you what? Aura to aura, a picture of non-perfusion, of vascularization, uh, looking for that peripheral ischemia. We don't, we're not there yet. We're not aura to aura all the way around the retina. But with these images that are eight by eight or big scans and you can use montages, we've got a pretty good idea uh, of what's going on for a good chunk of the retina there. 
And then the last thing I talked about it earlier, we do know that it doesn't identify microaneurysms quite as well, at least on a couple of studies. Uh, and I'll show you a picture from one of these studies. A and B on the left side there, that's your fluorescein angiogram. And you can clearly see uh, a lot of microaneurysms on that fluorescein angiogram. C and D on the right are your uh, OCT angiography images. Can't see quite as many MAs, again, according to this study, this picture right here. But again, you can localize the depth based on those segmentation slices through the retina. And I think you can identify diabetic macular ischemia, loss of capillaries uh, in this image. So you may read about that from time to time. Um, uh, and maybe can't detect MAs quite as good, but it certainly does a good job in localizing uh, those microaneurysms. A couple of cases very quickly. This was a, a patient that was an 82-year-old diabetic. He'd been diabetic for 45 years. So there'd been a lot, uh, a lot of years of, of potential damage. Uh, and there is his left eye. And you take a look at this overview scan and look right to that deep capillary plexus. And what do you see? It looks like the outer retina almost, where there's no vasculature anymore. Uh, this is a patient that was uh, 2030, actually, in this eye from likely diabetic macular ischemia. He does have a, an epiretinal membrane. Uh, looks like a little lamellar macular hole as well. But just wanted to show you. Let's go through slice by slice. Superficial capillary plexus. Even that one doesn't look too good, does it? I mean, certainly got a lot of loss of those capillaries. The deep capillary plexus, we've lost most everything. Then you get to the outer retina and the choriocapillaris. They look uh, pretty normal uh, as expected in that one there. But just wanted to show you an example of severe, significant capillary dropout uh, in a diabetic there. Other cases of branch retinal vein occlusion. This was a patient that had come in, had a long-standing uh, vein occlusion, was diabetic again for 35 years, 35 plus years actually. Uh, and his vision had dropped in the right eye because of the vein occlusion. But let me show you, and you can see there's the, uh, the B scans, the regular OCT. Notice the thinning uh, on the right eye. That was the eye with the, the, the prior history of a vein occlusion. Left eye was pretty good. He had lost some vision in the right eye, and clearly see why. Right under the fovea has had some atrophy of those outer retinal layers, the PIL line. But in the left eye, he was 20, 25 minus, 20, 30 plus uh, right in there. He's got a little bit of thinning on the OCT. And you take a look. And there's his OCT angiography in the left eye. Again, this is the non-vein occlusion eye. This is the eye that has better vision. But, and you see, in those two on the left side, we've again lost that, that vascular integrity in both the superficial and, again, note the deep capillary plexus. This isn't from the vein occlusion, because that was the other eye. This is his long-standing history of diabetes. Now, the purpose of the instrument is not to detect it at this stage, like we talked about before. It's to get it way sooner than this. Uh, and that's what's exciting about the technology. Here's the vein occlusion eye. And you look at this, was the vein occlusion superior or inferior? It certainly was inferior in this eye. It's nice to be able to see that uh, and see the level of ischemia, maybe the risk of neovascularization as these are happening uh, to detect possible neovascularization. I think the retinal community, the retinal docs are really going to like this to be able to see the amount of non-perfusion there. That was in the superficial. There's in the deep uh, capillary plexus as well. The outer uh, and the choriocapillaris look pretty good there. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy, to be able to image the neo like we talked about before, very, very nice. It's just a cool image to see how nice this highlights NVE or neovascularization, uh, excuse me, NVD or neovascularization of the disc uh, right there. A couple other scans. You know, I really like this scan right here that shows that little cystic spot, a little, little small cyst in the fovea. And vision's probably still pretty good, but you do the OCT angiography, and you can see where their little MA is. You can see where that little vascular change is, and, and maybe that's where the leakage is coming as well. So to me, knowledge is power, is it not? To be able to have an OCT and look at the structure, but then to be able to get the vascularization, the vasculature, knowledge is power, and it gives you a better understanding of what's going on in many conditions. There's an enlargement of the foveal vascular zone, significant. Uh, in a diabetic patient there. We're very excited about this and using this and getting more information.